Tonight, Apple's latest financial earnings smash expectations, Spotify loves families, and the war of the fitness wearables rages on. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 197 for Monday, October 20th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free two-week trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code TECHNIGHTS. I like that code. I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into today's tech feed. Apple announced its latest earnings today for the fourth quarter, ending September 27th. And numbers came in far above the company's own guidance for the quarter and even analysts' expectations. Apple posted $8.5 billion in earnings on revenue of $42.1 billion. It was particularly a big quarter for iPhones, with the first nine days of iPhone 6 and iPhone 6 Plus sales being added into those Q4 numbers. That's 39.2 million phones, up from 33.8 million phones that it sold during the same quarter last year. Not the case for iPads, though. Apple sold 12.3 million iPads, which is down from the 14.1 million the company sold during the same time last year. Macs were up, though. In a declining PC market overall, Apple reported sales of 5.52 million Macs, which is up from the 4.85 million that were expected and set a new all-time record during a quarter. Apple says that has a lot to do with emerging markets where Macs are being sold. On the earnings call following the numbers, CEO Tim Cook announced that Apple will introduce new financial reporting methods that'll lump the upcoming Apple Watch in with iPods, Apple TVs, and accessory sales from Beats in a new category called Other when the company reports its financials in the first quarter of 2015. Apple will also incorporate Apple Pay into the services category that goes alongside iTunes and software and other services. Speaking of software that has nothing to do with Apple, Google's been on an app updating spree to bring its apps up to date with the new material design look and feel particularly Gmail 5.0. Today, Android Police posted some screenshots of the updated app that show Google will now handle all email through the Gmail app, such as, oh, I don't know, your Yahoo email or your Outlook email, in addition to, of course, Gmail accounts. The process to switch between them is either a simple swipe or by touching the account drop-down button. Fitbit is getting ready to launch three new fitness trackers in a matter of weeks. The Charge and the Charge HR are updated versions of the Fitbit Force. You might remember it was pulled off the market after it caused some unfortunate skin reactions in some customers. So this is kind of the reinvention of that. The Charge HR also comes with Pure Pulse. That's Fitbit's wrist-based heart rate monitor. The Fitbit Surge is the third new wearable in this new category, referred to as a super watch by the company and marketing materials that were obtained by The Verge. The Surge will go for $249 and includes built-in GPS tracking, that pure pulse heart rate monitoring, promises real-time workout data for things like distance and pace and calories burned and how you're far you climbed in elevation, heart rate intensity, that kind of stuff. There's also sleep tracking, which monitors your sleep quality and then wakes you up with a vibrating alarm. Surge will offer your basic smart notifications for phone calls and texts, and you can also control music playback with the watch. Speaking of wearables, Forbes reports that Microsoft is launching its own wearable device within the next few weeks as well, citing anonymous sources. The gadget is said to be a smartwatch that passively tracks a wearer's heart rate. Boy, people just really want to know about heart rate. And is compatible with multiple mobile platforms with a battery life of more than two days of regular use. That's certainly going to beat the Apple Watch out of the gate. Uh, CEO uh, Tim Cook said that the Apple Watch was probably going to be needed to charge every night. Forbes reported back in May that Microsoft was working on the smartwatch with optical engineering expertise from its Connect division that could sync with iPhones and Android devices and Windows phones. So it looks like this may be coming to pass pretty soon. A wearable would be Microsoft's first new device category under CEO Satya Nadella. No word on the device's name or pricing. Spotify is giving its customers a price cut... 
if they're on family plans anyway. The company is offering a price cut on its subscription service by giving family members a 50% discount on additional accounts. So, for example, in the United States, it'll cost $14.99 for two users, $19.99 for three users, $24.99 for four users, $29.99 for five users. So, obviously, you, you know, more of you there are, the better your deal is. Spotify says that it has over 10 million people already paying for a subscription and 40 million users overall, and that the new pricing scheme will roll out globally over the next few weeks. This may also be in, in response or, you know, ahead of the response to reports that Apple has been pushing the music labels for even bigger price cuts for itself. It wants to relaunch the Beats Music subscription service at a price as low as $5 per month. Coming up later in the show, if you want top-notch matchmaking, Tinder wants to give it to you for a price. And up next, we'll chat with Forbes contributor Amit Chowdhury about what to expect from Apple's iOS 8.1, which went live today. But first, let's thank Squarespace.com. That's where this episode is coming to you from. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform that makes it easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. I should know. I made one of my own in about two seconds flat. Seriously, if you go to SaraLane.com, you'll see that I have some work to do. But what was so nice about it was that I just took a template that I put absolutely no work into and just said, it, it, apply this to all of my data that I already have. I could just go ahead and start with that. Uh, you, can, you can also create a logo creator tool if I want something that kind of matches my identity. I don't know how to create a logo. Squarespace actually has that built in. It's great for uh, individuals or small businesses. It's also easy to use. It's really easy to use Squarespace, but... If you want to get creative and maybe you have some questions, Squarespace has live chat and email support 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I have used it. I can vouch for it. And there's also a redesigned customer help site for access to self-help articles and really, really helpful video workshops. They'll just kind of walk you through something if you're not in the mood to talk to anybody, but you have some questions. There's also e-commerce functionality. All subscription plan levels get the ability to accept donations, which is great for if you're a nonprofit, you want to put a website around it, uh, a wedding registry, some sort of a fun drive, maybe for your school, your kid's school. Plans start at just $8 a month and include a free domain name if you sign up for a year. And last but not least, the new Squarespace metric app for iPhone and iPad is totally mobile ready. You can check, check site stats, page views, who's, who's, who's looking at your site, social media follows. And a blog app lets you make, obviously, text updates. You can change or add images, change some layouts, and, of course, monitor comments on the go. Hosting is included. Squarespace takes care of the hosting, so you don't even have to worry about it. It's an all-in-one solution. So start a free two-week trial, no credit card required, and start building your website today. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code TECHNIGHT. That's T-E-C-H-N-I-G-H-T, and get 10% off. And, of course, so you support for us. Thanks to Squarespace for the support of Tech News tonight. A better web awaits, and it starts with your new Squarespace website. Joining us now is Amit Chowdhury, contributor over at Forbes and first-time guest on TN2. Hello, Amit. Hi, Sarah. It's great to be here. Well, it's great to have you. I know you uh, wrote an article uh, today, a very helpful article, I might say, for anybody who's saying, all right, well, I know iOS... 8.1 is, is launching today, and then there's Apple Pay, and there's some, there's some new functionalities. What, what do you think are the, the big highlights here? I'd say that the biggest highlight is Apple Pay itself. Um, I know a lot of people that have the iPhone 6 and the iPhone 6 Plus are uh, very excited about getting access to Apple Pay so that if they're going out shopping at a store or a restaurant like Panera Bread or McDonald's, they can just um, you know move their uh, cell phone in front of the NFC enabled PO, um, sorry, point of sale system, mm -hmm. and uh, just pay right away. Um, and uh, I know that you can also track a lot of your transactions. So let's say a restaurant accidentally charges you the wrong amount, you can see it right on your phone what the exact amount that you were charged was, and uh, maybe you know tell the manager that it needs to be corrected. Now so. a couple of a uh, couple of my colleagues uh, were very excited about Apple Pay and went down to a, a market, Whole Foods Market, which is a, an, an Apple partner out of the gate, and uh, already has NFC point of sale systems in place. So you know, it's just a matter of wow, looks like magic. So everybody came back saying Apple Pay works really great, but mm -hmm. that only works if the retailer has has not only signed up to be a partner but has uh, the the appropriate uh, hardware in place on their end, and that's. That's not happening out of the gate today. 
Exactly. Like I read an article about how uh, Walmart, you know, the largest retail in the country, um, was not actually one of the partners that are supporting that's uh, supporting Apple Pay right out of the gate. So, you know, that's something that maybe Apple needs to work on and getting them signed up. And so that way it's a lot more useful since, you know, Walmart sees billions of shoppers enter their stores every every day, um, you know, every month. And uh, another um, complaint that I heard about was that uh, that. Apple doesn't support certain uh, branded credit cards. Like I know that Macy's has their own branded credit card and half of the transactions that uh, people use at Macy's is a Macy's credit card. So um, I know that they eventually plan to start supporting branded credit cards, but that's something that's not happening right out of the gate either. Now, uh, I saw some interesting numbers uh, today. Piper Jaffrey analyst Gene Munster uh, estimates that Apple Pay will generate mm -hmm. Probably revenue around 118 million in 2015. That's next year, of course, and 310 million in 2016. Is as, as much money as that sounds like. That's like like one percent of you know what what Apple would be pulling in fiscally overall. Although Eddie right. Q also said, uh, I believe it was today on the earnings call that he predicts the majority of uh, revenue from Apple Pay will come through in-app purchases. So those are purchases that could be made on an iPad, say, which doesn't actually have that NFC chip. Correct. Um, so I know, uh, I don't actually know the exact numbers for how much people spend uh, on in-app purchases, but I know that, uh, you know, to my understanding, a lot of uh, kids, they spend money buying digital goods through, you know, the Smurfs Village games, the, you know, your Angry Birds. Um, and, and I know that the App Store makes billions of dollars uh, every month. So, um, you know, that, that seems very realistic that, uh, you know, Apple Pay, since it's a convenient way to pay for purchases online, that let's say that I'm a parent and I want to buy my kid um, you know, like something fun for them to play that day. You know, if, if it's as easy as just, you know, putting my finger on the touch ID, then I could imagine that, you know, that seamless payment process uh, growing very quickly. As far as some uh, other uh, functionalities that come with 8.1 today, you know, you got the, you got the typical bug fixes, uh, some functionality for, for certain continuity features, uh, mm -hmm. which I'm still trying to get used to when somebody calls me my Mac rings. Uh, and then something, something I also thought was kind of interesting, it, it start because it, it, I do a show about iPads and, and, and iOS in general, and lots of complaints from people saying, why did the camera roll get changed to recent photos? We hate that. It sounds like Apple's listening, got enough negative responses that it's, 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 it's bringing camera roll back. Exactly. That was uh, something that I heard a lot of people complaining about when I, was reading through Twitter. A lot of people were writing, you know, where did the camera roll go? Is so much more convenient. This recently added photo album. It's not really uh, what I've been looking for. You know, it's, I don't know why they changed it to begin with. And, and Apple, I think that, uh, you know, under their current management, under Tim Cook's leadership, they're very receptive to feedback. And, um, and when a lot of people complain about things then they, you know, they respond to that. Uh, so I think bringing back the camera roll was a great idea. Um, and I'm, you know, uh, I'm looking forward to the other features that will be rolled out in the future versions of iOS and future versions of iOS. And what would that be? I mean, what what does iOS 8.1 not have right now that you 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 are you're you're, you're it, anticipating, expecting, which was in this version, et cetera? Um, what I was uh, what I think that they will roll out in the future is maybe some sort of um, connectivity to maybe seamlessly have your laptop connect to LTE through your phone. Maybe that could be a feature that, that could be a version uh, feature that could be added to iOS in the future. Um, let's see. Uh, there's, um, I'm trying to think of some other <laughs> features. Yeah. It's just, it's hard, it's well, you know, before, to... before the show, I, I asked you a little bit about your other job when you're, when you're not contributing to Forbes. And I know uh, you uh, are a co-founder of a company that, that, makes variety of apps. Uh, there, right. there was some news today that Apple will require iOS apps and updates to use the iOS 8 SDK, which includes 64-bit support uh, starting next February. Now, it sounds like, depending on who you ask, this is a headache or a pretty easy fix, but is designed to make apps, uh, you know, work better with iOS. How does that impact, a, you know, a, a small company like yours? Sure. Um, so, I believe changing it an app from a 32 um, to uh, from a 32 to a 64 bit. I don't think that's as big of a challenge as addressing the the segmentation of the different types of devices that are out on the market now. Like, um, you know, when you're talking about developing an app for that an app from the App Store now, now you have to make sure that's compatible with the iPhone 5 that has its own screen size, the 5s, the iPad Mini, 
the iPad mini with Retina display, iPad 2, iPad 3, iPad 4, all of them have different resolutions. And um, I'd say that the more the, the higher number of devices that they release for the market, that was be, that's what's becoming more of a challenge is addressing these different screen sizes. But the actual uh, converting of an app from 32-bit to 64-bit, I don't imagine that being a huge challenge uh, compared to the, you know, adjusting to the different screen sizes of the new devices. Oh, that's probably... Uh, sigh of relief from a lot of developers out there. Amit Chowdhury <laughs> is a contributor at Forbes and also pretty well versed in the iOS universe. Thanks so much for joining us, Amit. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And before you go, let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Sure. Um, you can find me on my Forbes column. It's uh, forbes.com slash sites slash Amit Chowdhury. Uh, you can also contact me on Twitter via at Amit Chowdhury. And uh, please email me anytime. My email address is achaudry at gmail.com. Excellent. Thanks so much. All right. right. Finally, uh, isn't it great how you can, you know, swipe right? Is that swipe right in your Tinder? I'm pretending. I've used it before. You swipe right in your Tinder app and then you're matched with the partner of your dreams that it doesn't really always work really that well, but the app is fun to use. Well, next month, Tinder says they will introduce a premium service. You know, like that you pay for in order to get even better matchmaking results because apparently they're not good enough yet. Paid features could include things like extended location settings instead of the current tender model, which only includes matches, you know, within a few miles of you. The company is pretty mum on other features, but said that the free app will continue to operate the way that it always has. Tender users currently view 1.2 billion profiles per day. And more than 15 million matches are made per day on Tinder. Now, note that a match does not mean that you're ever going to meet that person. And even if you meet them, that you'll actually enjoy their company. Just like real dating. And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. I am not better. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write us with feedback at TN2 at twit.tv. And don't miss Tech News today. That's tomorrow. Hosted by Leo Laporte, because Mike Elgin is off this week. And every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I will be hosting Thursday and Friday of this week. And of course, I'll be in TN2 all week as well. I'm Sarah Lane, and thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com. <laughs>